Kyle Wentz is with us today, and he's the Director of Administrative Operations at Hard Rock Roxino. And just a quick rundown of Kyle's bio. In 2006, Kyle, gra Kyle graduated from Ball State University with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Criminal Justice and Criminology. He began his career with the Indiana Gaming Commission and various ca capacities regulating various casinos in the state of Indiana until 2013. He currently is the Director of Administrative Operations with Hard Rock Roxino Northfield Park, and as a Director of Administrative Operations, he is responsible for all aspects of compliance as it relates to the casino business. Additionally, he is over the Cash Operations Department, Rock Stop, Ethics, and is the Problem Gambling Officer of the property. And with that, I'll turn things over to Kyle. Oh, before I turn things over to Kyle, should you have questions throughout today, please ask that in the question section of your GoTo webinar navigation panel. Uh, we'll be periodically stopping to look at those questions, and we'll also have some Q&A time at the end. So with that, I'll turn things over to Kyle. Well, good morning, everyone. Just uh, wanted to say thank you for having me. Um, we're very pleased to help uh, anyone that needs assistance in learning more about our business and how it relates to the work that you guys do in all of our communities. So it's it's a huge, huge burden on you guys, but I think the more that we can help educate you on what really happens inside the building, it will help you guys relate more to the clients and folks that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I'm going to get started. In my office with me, I have my compliance specialist, Greg Collison, here to assist us if there's any other questions that come up that I might not know. Um, but we'll be able to answer pretty much everything, hopefully, by the end and give you guys a good understanding of how things work in the casino environment. So let's go ahead and get started. You know, at the end of the day today, I hope that you guys will be able to understand you know, the basics of the gaming device, how the guests play the machines that are in our building, how the machines function, the different machine terminology that you hear throughout the industry, also how it's regulated. And then we want to get into a little bit more of the casino terminology on like win-loss, coin-in, uh, coin-out, those types of things. So, in the business, it's important that you guys know that you know it's really gaming devices. So you know a lot of people say slot machines, and we talk about different things, but gaming devices is really a large spectrum when you really start thinking about all the different products and things that are available to our guests and in our communities and, and states across the country. You know, as you see on the screen there, you see the basic slot machine or VLT, as it were. You know, in, in Ohio, we have to call them VLTs. Right. So that's the basic slot machine that you would see in Las Vegas or pretty much anywhere in the world. But below that, you also have a video poker option and component. And then on the bottom right and the bottom left, I want to kind of bring your attention to these two electronic gaming devices. And while they, these two items are not necessarily legalized yet in Ohio for the racetrack casinos, they are something that is, that is allowed in a lot of other jurisdictions, and I believe at some point, will more than likely be allowed in our racetrack casinos here in the state of Ohio. So that's an electronic table game to the bottom right, and then to the bottom left is an electronic poker table. So what's interesting about these is, you know, a lot of the states went to, you know, these VLT type systems where they go, well, we're not going to allow any live table game, you know, or that's where the state or the government has drawn the line and saying, well, we'll allow some gaming devices and because games of chance. So a lot of a lot of folks and a lot of laws will say, you know, we'll allow anything that's an electronic gaming device that, that is all based on chance. Well, a lot of the companies saw this and then decided, well, okay, well let's make electronic table games. And these effectively function just like a slot machine. So on that table game on the bottom right, you still get a random number generator inside there that will generate the cards that show up on the screen, and you have the dealer there on a TV screen, basically this program to just go through the table and say hit or hit or just stand or what have you. On the, over on the left, what's really interesting about the video poker table or regular poker table there is it's all electronic, and something as simple as those little screens are where the player sits, and you put your hands over that screen, and that's when you actually get your cards flipped up to show you your hold cards as if you were playing on a live table. And they have timers and everything else. It's actually a little bit of a faster game because the timers are literally right there in front of you. You can't just hold on to your cards and sit there for 10, 15 minutes to make a decision. But these are all different 
gaming devices that are out there and that will probably be in our market at some point here in the state of Ohio. So I wanted to make sure that you understood that you know, a gaming device may not just be a slot machine. While they all work very similar and they all have a lot of similar parts, which we're getting ready to get into, they, they can offer a, a plethora of different, um, different uh, experiences out on our gaming floors. So the basic usage for a guest to use one of these, you know, let's just stick with slot machines or VLTs at this point, is a guest wants to come up and play on these slot machines VLTs. They may or may not insert a player's card. It's not required in, here in Ohio. In some states it is required. Uh, some states have loss limits and other things, but here in Ohio we do not. So they have, they may, do not have to put a card in, so they may insert their player's card, they may not. As soon as they place money into our bill acceptor, and then the corresponding credits will show up on the credit meter, the guest then selects the amount of bet and how many lines, and those credit values range from a penny all the way up to $100. And oftentimes a guest can be very confused um, in an environment where you have multiple lines and multiple, you have games that go up to 50 lines, you have games that are three lines, you have games that are 200 lines. So, I mean, it's, it's clearly on them to look at the button panel, but it's obvious that a lot of times people can get overwhelmed and misunderstand what's happening and they'll make an incorrect bet or they'll bet one time and don't realize they just bet $10 and it's like, oh crap, I didn't mean to do that. So there's definitely some, some some learning curve to what happens out on the floor. You know, I say single line to 45 lines, but they go up to like 200 lines. There's a bunch of different options that are out there for the guest. The guest plays the game or spins the barrels and then their results are displayed. If they win or they don't win, either way, whenever they're finished, they can cash it out. And when they hit cash out, they'll receive what we call a Tito ticket or a voucher that is, you know, stands for ticket and ticket out. And it's a cashless voucher that allows the guest to either take that to another machine, take it to the cage, or um, to a kiosk to be cashed out. So when the guest is playing the game, there's some basic devices or some basic components of the game that, that you would want to know if you're in our, in our environment. In Stardark Casino and inside a VLT, inside a slot machine, you have all these different things out there. You have the, the cabinet, you have a CPU, and the CPU is much like your, your desktop computer. So if you have your desktop computer, there's a motherboard inside of there. And inside these slot machines, there's, there's no difference. Inside there, there's a CPU. It has a motherboard. It has RAM. It has everything. It has a video card. It has fans. It has all the things that your desktop computer would have. But the one thing that your desktop computer doesn't have inside of it that these do have is an RNG or a random number generator. And I'm going to go into how those work in just a few seconds. But that's kind of the main component of what makes the slot machine really go. Additionally, we have a display, which is either physical reels or it's a video monitor. We also have what we would call a bill acceptor, a bill validator, and then also a cash box. And I'm going to show you a pictures of what all these look like. So you saw the different slot machines earlier, but here's two basic slot machines for you to kind of look at just for us to focus on. So you'll see to the left you have a real slot machine and we, those are actual physical reels inside there. And on, so on those reels it's interesting because there's a little notches, much like a wagon wheel. There's a spoke inside there and there's literally up to 64 notches on every single reel. So if you think about this, there's 64 positions for each reel. So 64 times 64 times 64 is the amount of different uh, prob possibilities that could show up on the screen. To the right there you see a video uh, screen, and this is an example of a 90 cash lines here. So each one of those little color squares on the right or left is a line on that screen. So they go in zigzags, they go up and down, and there's just a multitude of different lines. And oftentimes the guests don't even know by looking at the screen if they've won, especially on a game like this, because you basically have 90 different lines. So there's not one person, even us, if we go up and deal with a guest question or, uh, or concern, we literally have to pull open the menu and look for the different lines that are there and show them why something was or was not a winner. But those are the two basic cabinets. At the top there, you can see that the red square up on the top right, that's where you would insert a player's card. And then to the left of that, that 
center monitor that says over $300 on the right side and it says earn points on the left side, that's what we would call the eye view or that's the, the screen that displays all the information about the, the, the guest player club card and the things that are available to them as far as offers, promotions, and so forth. So here's your first look inside of our slot machines that we are focusing on here. You see the reel on the left and then you see the video monitor on the right. But what you do see that's the same is you see is CPU. And you can see my, my uh, mouse here. The left is the CPU over here on the left on that, uh, for the real game. And over here on the right, here's the CPU. It's more in a horizontal fashion right here underneath uh, this video screen. So as you can see, there's not a whole lot in there. I think people think there's a lot going on. And in fact, in the older days when there wasn't a random number generator and it was literally a mechanical slot, which is many, many, many moons ago, you would see a lot of contractual contraption type stuff in here. And you know, honestly, going to the electronic is obviously much more fair and you don't have any kind of these you know, cheating and things like that or, or just kind of gone by the wayside when it comes to slot machines. So there's that CPU and the stuff we were talking about. So this is what we would call the bill acceptor. So right here is the bill acceptor as you would put in your money. This is what goes in. A bill validator actually monitors that bill, looks at it, and sees is this a legitimate bill. So that's actually looking for security features on the bill, making seeing you know what kind of bill it is, so they can tell the machine uh, where, what, how many credits to put on the game. So those bill acceptors, and usually it's JCM is the is the vendor for those. Those are actually used by the federal government. So the federal government actually tests on the same bill acceptors that we use in casinos across the country to ensure that the bill, make sure all the security features in a bill are up to snuff. These are the most advanced bill acceptors and bill validators in the world. So if you were to put in a counterfeit bill, so if someone were to bleach a $5 bill and make it a $100 bill, you can't bleach out the security features, you can't remove the security features of a $5 bill. The bill validator will actually see the, the security features and call it a $5 bill. So oftentimes we'll have a guest put in a counterfeit, not oftentimes, but once in a while, a guest will put in a counterfeit $100 bill and they'll get $5 worth of credit. And then they want to go, oh, wait a minute, I put in 100 So, And at that point, we'd have to ask the guest, yeah, hey, what other bills do you have? But just to kind of give you an example of you know, how they work and the importance of those. The bottom down there is the cash box or the cash box door. So behind there is a, is a um, plastic box that collects all of those bills that are going in. So here's an, a little close-up picture of underneath that real slot machine is there's the CPU that I pointed out earlier. If you were to take a key and turn it in there and pull that handle out and you flip it over, that motherboard and, and the software that's in there is very similar to what you would see inside of your computer if we were to take off the different panels and other things. And again, on the, the monitor side, there it is again. So these are just the basic insights of you know, a slot machine. So how does this all work? So we'll, to put it all together, you have the, the board inside there, the motherboard that we were talking about, or that CPU. And that starts at the top. And inside that machine, or inside that motherboard, is both operating software and game software. So the operating software works just like your computer. It's like a Microsoft Windows, or iOS for Mac users, or whatever. And then your game software is whatever specific game you're running. What's unique to these is that it's just one piece of software. So your home computer, you have hundreds of programs, whether it be Windows or Office or Outlook or games that your kids put on there or anybody else. But inside here, that game software is specific to that game and it matches up to that specific operating software and that's the only thing on there. There's also graphics, obviously sound, and then that random number generator is also part of that game software. And then at the end, you get a final product in real to the screen. And then those results actually are linked back to our back of house system so we can track every spin, every penny that goes in, every machine, every penny that goes in, every penny that goes out. So we said earlier that you would know how things are, are regulated inside the casinos and how we ensure those random number generators and things are working properly, which I'm going to go into the specifics of how that random number generator works in just a second. So just a real quick glimpse into how these things are regulated. So Every, almost every casino in the state, in the, I know every casino in the state of Ohio and others, every casino throughout the country 
has some sort of regulatory body that looks for multiple things. So the majority of the time, they are having to be tested by a third-party lab. And a lot of folks are using like GLI as a company that we would work with, gaming laboratories, or here in Ohio, we have Intralot that does things. But basically, they're going to take that software. And the different types of software, we call them EPROMs. They come in USB. They come in flashcards. They are sometimes installed on the hard drive already. But what ends up, ends up happening is that software gets sent to those third-party labs. They test them. And then they come out with some kind of a, a signature that is to be tested inside of a test machine. And those signatures are what tell us whether the game works properly or not. And in some states, the agents or the regulatory body will go out and ensure and test that game to ensure that that signature is what's occurring in that software. In the state of Ohio, you have Intralot for the lottery regulated casinos, and they actually can see it from their lab because we are hooked into their system. So they can see and test anytime they want. In fact, they test multiple times a day to ensure that the games that we say are there are there and that they are meeting the standard that was approved by the state regulator. So it's, it's a very, very regulated business. And that's why we, we as casinos, I think most people think that we are, we are against slot machines and bars and things like that because we're losing money. That's not really the case. I am particularly against slot machines and VFWs and bars and things like that. One, because we can't look for it from a responsible gaming standpoint. We can't help somebody. Secondly, the majority of the time, it may not be set up fairly. And thirdly, there's no one there to ensure that everything is being done on the up and up. So those are the things that you get weary of when it's, when it's ran by independent people that have no idea necessarily what they're doing. And, you know, all they do is turn it up so that they're making profit and there's very little win on the guest side. So here's what some of that software looks like. This is really funny. When you look at these EPROMs, this is one of the basic softwares that are inside the machine. And that EPROM has 64 legs. And uh, what's interesting about this is this actually, this technology was developed in the 1970s and was used by NASA. And we're still using it in, in games today. So it's kind of ironic that there are still machines on the floor that are using like 1970s software technology in delivering some of these games. They're getting few and far between now, but they're still out there. Uh, you see more of these now. We have flashcards. And then we go into these USBs. So a lot of these USBs are plugged in, and they will work right off of that USB stick. And the software kind of runs uh, through the game using those. So let's talk a little bit about what is a random number generator. And I think this is the one that's going to generate the most amount of questions and, and thoughts from you guys. Because I think, generally speaking, people have a basic idea of what they think a random number generator is, but I don't think they really truly know what's really going on with it. And the, real, the one thing I want to know is that it's always moving. It's a perpetually moving random number generator, which means that whether there's money in the machine, whether somebody's playing it, or whatever, if the machine is on, it's generating random numbers. It's continuously generating random numbers. So as long as it's on, it's going to generate a random number every millisecond. So the way that's set up is it's through a special algorithm. And that algorithm is based on a pay table, but it's set on a pay table that's over a million cents. So for you to hit a pay table, so one of the things that I get frustrated with in Vegas and some of these other places that are a little more loosely regulated when it comes to marketing, you see Vegas goes, well, we have a 99% payback on our machine. And all they're saying is they set the machine to 99% payback. Well, all that means is if you have the money to sit there for a million polls, if you have a million dollars and you can sit there and go through a million polls, then you will get to 99% payback eventually. But what's going to happen is over time, it's going to go through peaks and valleys. It's going to go as low as 80%, and it's going to go higher than 100%. But it eventually will even out to 99%. And this is the fallacy that happens within a lot of our gamblers. And this is some of the problem that they they experience out on the floor because they'll say, well, this machine's hot. We need to stay on this machine. Well, it's not really hot. It may be going through a, a small peak, but it, and I guess you could call it as hot, but at any second, it can turn back the other way. It's, there's no, no memory. There's no knowing you know, whether it's going to hit or not hit, which is what's interesting. The other thing that's interesting is you'll see a lot of players 
play without their card. And they'll go, well, I don't want the machine to know it's me. Well, it doesn't matter because that top box, that top box I showed you where the card goes in, it's really only connected to our back of house system. And it's only really recording, you know, the results of the machine and whether you cash out or you put money in. It's not seeing the result of the machine, i.e., it doesn't know that you're there when it hits a jackpot. It knows that your card's in the machine, and it knows a jackpot hit, and then on the back end, it matches those two things up. So the game doesn't know that's great Colison sitting there hitting the jackpot. The game doesn't know anything because it's producing that RNG. It's not connected to that player's card at the top and saying, well, we need a hit now because this person's here or whatever. It has nothing to do with that at all. So there's a lot of fallacies when it, when it comes to that type of thing. So what I want to do here is I want to show you, I have a video queued up to kind of walk you through what an R and random number generator would look like. So this is just kind of a basic slot machine. So you see the video, you know, spinning the reels there. And this actual video is focusing on the spin stop button. Because as you know, in some places when you spin it, you can hit stop really fast. And some people think that changes their their outcome of winning or that, you know, there's a skill to trying to stop the, the reels to get on the, the, the graphic that you want or the, or the symbol that you're looking for. But that's really not the case. As we discussed earlier, when we talk about the random number generator perpetually moving, you know, it, it already has the results as soon as you hit spin. So as soon as you hit spin, because it's producing a random number every millisecond, it's literally already got the results inside there. So whether you hit the skill stop or not, it's not truly a skill stop. It's literally already producing that number before it even displays it on the screen. So as you can see here, it's showing you the CPU inside and where that random number generator lives in the software. And if you look up at the left, that's the example of a perpetually moving random number generator. So as you see there, there's a number for each one of those lines. So when you hit the spin button, it's literally going to stop, and it's already got your numbers of the positions of the reels or where they're going to end up. And then that's what obviously is displayed on the screen to the right. So when it spins it again here and the person hits the, hits the skill stop per se, they think, oh my gosh, I'm going to make it stop at a different one. No, it's not going to stop at any different one. It literally already has the result there for you. Similarly to what happens in a bonus round, it's funny, I don't like telling people this because it ruins their, ruins their gaming experience to an extent, but the truth of the matter is that when you hit a bonus round on a slot machine, it already knows what you're going to get as the outcome for the most part. So like, for example, if you've played a quick hits game in any of our casinos and the bonus round pops up and it has choose your box. And it has all the different boxes. It has, you know, you can get 20 lines times three or you know, 15 lines times two or whatever. And when you match three of those different ones as, the, as you select them throughout this big box of picks, that's what you're going to win. But ironically, people get frustrated because the, the screen's not calibrated and they wanted to pick this box and then it flips up and shows them, well, if you would have picked over here, it would have been this. If you would have picked over there, it would have been this. It's not true. It literally made it prolong out just so that it's entertaining for you. But as soon as you hit the bonus round, it knew what three was going to match before the end of the bonus. So it's interesting. I, you don't tell people a lot of that because they get frustrated and it, it takes away all the fun. But that's truly what is really going on inside of those machines. So that random number generator is perpetually moving. And you know, the other thing is you saw all those numbers. So there was five different numbers. On a real machine that has three reels, there's less numbers, obviously, and that's what the algorithm is kind of built in for, so it knows how many positions and how many symbols and what have you. So if that number, those three numbers, show at 22, 34, and 46, it literally is going to stop on the 22nd notch, the 34th notch, and the 46th notch of that reel. And whatever the display is, is the display. The system itself knows that if it would have hit 35, 35, 35, that's a winning combination. So as soon as you hit spin, and if it came up 35, 35, 35, they're already locking up to the jackpot before your spin is even complete. So that's really how a slot machine works when it comes to the random number generator and how the skill stop really doesn't matter and the bonus stuff really doesn't matter. That's all really just bonus for entertainment value than anything and prolonged gameplay. Because 
the truth of the matter is if we could speed this thing up and make a basic game that you could get, you know, 80 spins an hour and take five seconds to spin, you know, that does us no good if someone is not winning anything or they lose all their money in two minutes. So you want a lot of build-in features and a lot of build-in stuff to really you know, hopefully make it an entertaining experience for the guys and not completely just, just kill them at the beginning. So that's the kind of basics that, you know, so far we've covered. We've covered, you know, the basics of how a machine works. We've covered the basics of how it gets used in the machine. And then I showed you a little bit about the random number generator and how that all kind of unfolds out in front of you on the screen. And the next thing I want to kind of get into a little bit, and this is really going to be really interesting to you guys, is the casino terminology. So, you know, a lot of times what's, what's interesting and what's frustrating at all in the same time is that it's hard to know a lot of times what a guest has done or has or hasn't done when it comes to gambling. Uh, so when we try to deal with a guest in the environment and try to see if they have a problem with gambling, it's often difficult because they don't always play with their card. So it gets tough because a guest oftentimes, as you know, oftentimes will lie or exaggerate their wins and losses, which is obviously a sign of problem gambling. But it's tough to know really what the truth is because we don't know for sure what their real coin in is. So if I'm playing with my card, and then I pull it out for half of my spins, I really don't truly know how much was spent. The other thing is a lot of times when you get reports from casinos, and a lot of times you may get information from a casino that, you know, this person might have a problem, it's, int it's important for you to know the difference between coin out, coin in, and win. So let me do some basic math and just to kind of explain to you what occurs. So we obviously have reports that say Kyle put in hundred dollars in cash into this machine but that doesn't necessarily mean that's my coin in or that's how much I won or lost or how much the casino won or lost my hundred dollars in cash going in could could be from something I cashed out before it could be out of my pocket it could be from a lot of different things obviously but when I put that hundred dollars in and let's say I spend the reels ten times for a dollar and I don't win anything my coin in at that point is ten dollars now let's say on my 11th spin of a dollar, I hit $20. Now all of a sudden my coin in will become $11 and my coin out at this point is $20. If I don't cash out, that just remains my coin in and coin out. So if I don't cash out at that point, I may be up $9, but I've not cashed out yet. So let's now say I take that $20 and then I put it all in and I don't win another thing. Now my coin in is $31 and my coin out is $20. That would generate what we would call a casino win of $11. So we really only made $11 at the end as, as far as our win goes, even though all the money that came out, they actually put a lot of that money back in. That's not a win to us because it's just money we gave out that gave come back to us. So that's where things get confusing when we talk about win, coin in, and coin out. The other thing I like to point out is that's really how we invest in a player. You know, the casino marking or the player's card portion, you know, that's, we use that win number to determine, you know, do you, do you reward them with free play? Do you give them points for all their coin in? You give them points to either use at a restaurant to buy tickets or to get tickets for a show you know, in our property to get gas, you know, different things that are out there for the guests. It's really that card, and I know it's, I sound like the devil sometimes, and I know you guys have heard me speak at several conferences, but the, really that card is no different than any other card that you have on your key ring right now. Some of you may have a get-go card, some of you may have a Kroger card, some of you have Speedway cards, you even have little cards for a lot of your big places, Best Buy, you know, Home Depot, you know, all these different places. They do the same thing that we do. When they use your email address to send you in your receipt, they are now tracking the stuff that you buy, and they know what to focus on in marketing. So that if I know that Greg bought buys a a gas grill every two years, then I may want to send Greg a special marketing for a new gas grill two years from now. I may want to send him a twenty dollars off coupon that's different than everyone else. So it's no different than a lot of different uh, stuff that's out there. You know, when we do with the marketing, that's kind of kind of similar to a lot of other industries and organizations. The last thing I wanted to kind of talk about was the mythology. So 
I've, I've heard a lot of different things, and please give Derek any of your questions on any of the other mythologies. I tried to put in here some of the things that, um, that we see or we hear on a regular basis, but you may have some other ones that you've heard that we can try to debunk or confirm, as it were. Uh, the first one, if I play with a player's card, it decreases my, chancing of, decreases my chances of winning. You know, that's where you get the people that pull out the card and they, then they spin for a while and then they put their card back in. It really doesn't matter. Your card going, being in or out is not influencing what the random number generator is, is going to display for you. It has nothing to do with it at all. A lot of people think that it does, but it doesn't. Um, does a casino pump oxygen out of the machines to the players? Uh, that is absolutely false. That would be very expensive to do, one. And secondly, you know, it gets really warm in those machines, so I don't even know where you would put any kind of an oxygen tank or anything of that nature, but obviously we do not do that. That's, that's a huge myth. I've never seen that ever done, and I've been to casinos in six different states and two different countries, so not seen that done at all. Uh, near miss, this machine's about to hit. Did you see how close that jackpot that was to a jackpot? You know, we see this a lot because, you know, a lot of the, a lot, there's a lot of stops on the machine. When you think 64 times 64 times 64, obviously there are some combinations that hit more than others, but it's still random. If you get two of the symbol and then you just, it just misses the last symbol by a, a scotch, that doesn't mean it's about to hit. It's truly an independent spin. Each time you hit spin, it's a brand new game. It's as if you walked up and put a dollar in for the very first time every single time you spin. It has no memory of, it has no recollection of you putting in $100 so far and that, oh man, I gotta pay this guy a little something or he's not gonna continue to play. It, it's not that at all. It's literally a new spin, a new game every time you hit that button. Um, this jackpot has not hit for a while, it's due. You know, we have no idea. Nobody knows. We don't have any idea. Um, the guest doesn't have any idea when a jackpot is about to hit. Um, it's interesting because I, I believe some casinos are somewhat misleading when they put out, they'll put out sheets that say, these are the hot sheets. This is the hot sheet of the week. And they'll tell you all the machines that hit multiple jackpots this week. These are the hot machines. It's just, it's truly just a matter of randomness. You know, if you, What's interesting about those hot machines is they probably have more point in than any of the other machines on the, on the floor. So, yeah, they're going to have more jackpots because they have more play. So it's not that the machine is hotter. It's just that it's getting more play, thereby creating more jackpots just by a, a, a faction of having more money go through it. So there's really no such thing as we knowing that a jackpot's going to hit or if it's going to be if it's due for a hit. I've seen casinos put in a half a million dollar top prize progressive jackpot and it literally hit within a week. Now the casino's upset because they're like, well, wait a minute here. That should have hit for a while. Of course there's a thought process on how long it should take before it hits, but no one knows when it'll hit. And what's ironic is in that situation, I happen to be a regulator and I said, well, wait a minute. You guys are playing the game just like the guest is playing the game. You can't be upset that this jackpot hit, and of course they thought there was something wrong with the game, but there was nothing wrong with the game. It, the random number generator worked, and it paid out my $100,000 jackpot within the first week. So it's, it is part of doing business, it's part of being a casino, and the truth of the matter is, we want people to hit jackpots. We want to give money back. We want people to get a good experience. It does no good for us to have someone come in. It is an absolutely false it is definitely a mythology that a casino wants to take all of your money. It does mean no good for you to come in and empty your bank account and your savings account and have nothing left because you walk out feeling broken, feeling hurt, beat up, and guess what? You'll never come back. Well, at least I would hope you would never come back after that experience. But if you come in and your budget is $100 and you lose $100 and you play for a couple hours or come in, you played $100, and you walk out with $150, guess what? You're probably going to come a lot more over the next few months. And if, if you lose $50 at a time, I'd much rather you come and lose $50 over time hundreds of times over the next four or five years than to come one time and us get all your money in one fell swoop. It does no good for us to do that. Um, 
Another mythology, loose machines are located at the entrances and near the aisles. Again, not true. Um, it, it's kind of what I said earlier in that those games seem to get more play because they're the more visible games and they're the easiest. People like to sit on an aisle. Most of the time in casinos, if you've got a bank of machines that have, like, let's say, three or four you know, side by side, people do not like to play in the middle. They want to play on the end because they don't have to be uh, surrounded by somebody. So that's merely why they get more play. It's not because they're actually set up to be paying more. Um, if I pull the handle instead of hitting the button, I have a better chance of winning. We've seen a lot of people that are very superstitious on the gaming floors. They either rub the screen or they you know, have a different combination of buttons or they'll say alternate pulling the handle, the one-arm bandit, or you know, hitting the spin button, pulling out my card, putting in my card, cashing out, putting the ticket back in. None of that stuff matters. It doesn't change your chances of winning, and it doesn't um, do do anything else. Um, so one of the questions that just come up that I'll answer here while we're still talking about it, what's the difference between a VLT and a slot machine? There really is no difference. Um, at the end of the day, a VLT, video lottery terminal, the only difference in the state of Ohio is that it's continuously monitored by the regulator. Normal slot machines in like Las Vegas, Indiana, um, other jurisdictions, Atlantic City, they have they don't have a continuous regulator regulator monitor monitoring system. Like if you go back if you look at the picture from earlier where I showed you there's the insides of that machine, you'll see there's tape on that machine. So that tape right there is the regulator that's making sure that that stuff that we tested was sealed and put in there um, and not tampered with. So that there's different forms of regulation in Ohio. They have the intra lot. That's the reason they call them BLTs, and it's really a state law that they're to be called BLTs because in their mind, hitting the spin bucket, spin button is the same as a scratching a scratch-off ticket, although it's really the same as a slot machine. There's really no difference. There's no part or anything in there that's different other than the monitoring uh, by intralot. Uh, another question that come up was, how do slot tournaments work? Um, slot tournaments, so there's a tournament mode, and the tournament mode has a, a bit of a different working um, algorithm than, um, sorry, than normal play because it's, it's really set up to um, kind of play in a sense where it's a lot more fun. There's a lot more things happening. There's a lot more hit. So it literally decreases the amount of outcomes. So when the random number generator switches into tournament mode, it decreases the amount of non-wins or non-hits, and it, ha it increases the amount of hits to make it more fun for the people playing those. Um, the difference between, another question came up is what is the difference between a slot machine and a video poker machine? The video poker machine has a random number generator just like a slot machine, where there is a game of, there is a bit of skill in the video poker because of the amount of cards in the deck. So there's 52 cards in the deck, so the amount of random outcomes is decreased. So when people say they're playing, when they play a video poker machine and there's some skill to it, the skill is really not a skill as much as it is two different strategies. So the two different strategies is either I'm playing to win anything I can win, or I'm playing to win a royal flush or the top prize. If I'm playing a strategy to get to a royal flush, then I'm going to only hold cards that are going to give me a chance to get a royal flush, i.e., if I have an ace of clubs, a king of clubs, and then three other random cards, but I might have a king of diamonds and a ten of hearts, I'm going to throw away my king of diamonds and ten of hearts because I'm holding the ace of clubs, king of clubs, to try to get the royal flush, which is the ace, king, queen, jack, and ten of the same suit. So in this case, all clubs. So the, that's the kind of the, the controversy in video poker is that they're saying that there's some skill to it. There's not necessarily skill to it. It's just a decreased amount of outcomes, and that could be affected by the way you play because the amount of cards left in the deck on each hand. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> um, and, and that's pretty much Does anybody have any other mythology questions or anything else? I mean... That's the end of my what I set up for you guys as a presentation. I know it seems kind of basic, and I think this is something we can grow on in the future and add to, um, but I definitely wanted to um, give you guys kind of some basic ideas and thoughts behind it.
So we had a question come up here that says, um, can the credit value per dollar be changed in the machines or is the credit value per dollar set by the machine developer? That's a great question. So inside the machine, there actually is, you can set it up to do different things. The, you could hard, the manufacturer generally allows you to set the credits to be however you want them to be. So i.e., you could have it be a penny machine, a nickel machine, a quarter machine, you know, 50 cents, a dollar, whatever. We actually make that selection. And if you notice, most casinos today have what we would call a multi-denom setup. So, which means you can come up as a guest, and if you want to play for quarters, you can play quarters. If you wanted to play for dollars, you can play dollars. You can play five dollars, you can play five dollars. So you literally have the choice to change your credit or what your credits are worth. So it doesn't change the outcome of the game, i.e., if I'm playing 75 cents, if it's a three-line or three-reel game and the max bet is a three-credit max bet, whether you're betting three-quarters, three-dollars, three-fives, it doesn't change the percentage or the hold. It literally is just changing what the amount that you could possibly win. So it is set by the developer as far as your options, but the casinos themselves decide what they should be set at. Some of them don't make a multi-denom. Some of them may want this area of the floor to be dollar bill machines or dollar machines. So they'll make all those 100 machines all be worth only a dollar. New question came in. Um, is there a difference between in the randomization for video poker than VLTs? No, it's, it's really a, a random number generator. But remember, like I said earlier, if you take 64 times 64 times 64, your outcomes are much different than if you have just 52 cards in a deck. So you're talking about 262,144 outcomes on a three real slot machine. Whereas when you're looking at a video poker machine, you're talking 52 cards in the deck. So if you get dealt four cards, or five cards, excuse me, and you take back three cards, then you are literally have only used 10 cards out of the 52 cards in the deck. So which means it leaves you a 1 in 47 outcome to get your next three cards that you're looking for. So it's, it's just much different when it comes to, the randomization is not any different when it comes to the random number generator. It's literally the, the lack of outcomes available that make it um, less of a variety, I guess is probably the better way to say it. And I'm not a mathematician, but that's the way I would explain that. Any other questions? Derek, did you get any other things? If you want to open it up, you can open it up. Okay, and those are all the questions that we have now. If you do have a question, please feel free to ask that in the question section of your GoToWebinar navigation panel. Looks like we're getting one more pop in. And while I'm sending this over to Kyle, um, just so you all know, this session is recorded and will be sent along with a copy of the PowerPoint uh, for you to review at a later time. Uh, as well as your certificate, and that will all be sent out um, sometime tomorrow. So you have that coming to you. And Kyle, here's a question I just sent your way. So the question is, is there a difference in the predictability of video poker machines and slot machines? Um, and then the, the follow-up to that was there were media reports after the Las Vegas shooting that the shooter would watch machines and select machines based upon his observations of other players' machines. Is this possible? You know, like I said earlier, it, it's not possible in a sense because he's looking for things to be hot or not hot in that scenario. And as I told you earlier, each spin itself is its own thing. Could it could a machine be kind of hitting a peak and seem like it's hitting more frequently than a machine beside it? Absolutely it could. But you don't know when that's gonna stop or change. Like if you could hit I've seen people hit a jackpot and then when they hit their jackpot they go do all the paperwork, the, the, the attendants come back, you sign the paperwork, and in some casinos they have what they call a spin-off, where the, they have the guests go ahead and spin the machine one time to, to let that, to get that off the screen, that jackpot, so that someone else can't come up and try to say they hit the jackpot or whatever. But I've actually seen when they've spun off and hit the button again that another jackpot would occur. I've also seen where you've hit a jackpot and then it hasn't hit a jack, never hits a jackpot again for three weeks. So it's truly random in general between, you know, whether something is hot or not and watching a machine and knowing that you think it's hot is, is truly, you don't know. It's, it's truly luck. It, there's no way around that. When it comes to the predictability of video poker machines and slot machines, 
Now, video poker itself has what we would call a lower hold, which means that it actually pays back players more than a typical slot machine. But again, that's because of the lack of games available, so or cards available. So if you're at a game where it pays out two pair, the probability of getting two pair is is pretty good. I mean, you can get a two pair with 80% of the time if you're getting a random five set of cards. You can expect between 70 and 80% of the time to get a two pair at least dealt to you. Now, you may be on a game where it doesn't pay out two pair. That's why there's a multiple pay, pay tables and a lot of times when you play video poker. If you walk up to a video poker machine, you'll find that when you select the games screen where it has all the different options on what games to play, there's probably 40 different games. You select a game and then you look up at the pay table, that's what's going to tell you whether a game is going to be a more frequently hit game or if it's really geared towards a royal flush. Like if you look at the top and it says it pays out the minimum payout is for three of a kind, then you're probably on a Deuces Wild or a Joker's Wild or something like that where it's going to frequently, you're going to see three, three of a kind 60% of the time, which means you're going to hit it quite often if you're playing just to get a little bit of money. So it's really, there is no real difference in the randomization or the or guessing the outcome of video poker versus versus games. It's really, really truly is just a, a minimum amount of actual outcome. So I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys. I, I want, please send Derek any feedback for me. Um, or, or if there's any other subjects or topics or any more, if you want me to go any deeper on any of these types of things, I truly want it to be a little more basic and a little more upfront with it just to kind of give you guys kind of your get your feet wet on what this stuff means. That way when the guest comes in and you, or your, 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 your client comes in and they go, I knew that machine was hot or I, I went back and got more money because I thought it was going to hit, you can really explain to them, look, man, Every spin you spin is a new game. It doesn't matter if you stayed on there for two hours. It doesn't matter if you put $1,000 in there. It doesn't matter if you put $5 in there. You could randomly walk up to a machine, put $5 in, and hit a $10,000 jackpot. It has no real idea or knowing or have any, there's no bearing on how much you've played or your player's card or anything on whether you would win or not win. So just keep that in mind for your players, and uh, hopefully that will help you or or your clients, sorry, I say players because those are the people we have on our side. But uh, I truly want to be an olive branch to you guys and be able to answer any questions. Derek has my uh, email. So if you have any questions or anything, please have, don't hesitate to send them over, and I'd be happy to, you know, talk to you offline about that. And I hope to get to speak to you guys again. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, Kyle. And Kyle is the Director of Administrative Operations at Hard Rock Rock Sino up in Northfield Park. And uh, Kyle has been great at helping answer those questions and will also be working uh, for Prom Gambling Awareness Month to set up some visits. And Kyle has offered several times for folks to come and tour his property and get a, a better sense of uh, what the um, patron experience is like and uh, kind of how things are set up to debunk some of those myths. So I uh, wanted to let you know that that is also something that we're working toward and uh, we'll continue to uh, really build that bridge between the gaming side and the prevention and treatment side because it's really something that we're all working in together. Um, I do have one other question. Uh, uh, Kyle, if you wanted to address the last question that popped in and then uh, we will close for the session. And that question is, uh, I've also read that a conversation poker player can make a living playing video poker. Uh, can you speak to any truth to that? No, there's people that claim that they are making a living you know, playing the video poker machine. And the truth of the matter is if you play basic strategy, you can cut the house advantage down quite a bit. So just like in blackjack, if you play basic strategy, you can cut the house advantage down to like 0.1%. And what's interesting about video poker is that that is actually a better advantage to cut the house down because when you're playing blackjack, you can play basic strategy and cut the house advantage down to like less than a percent, but you can't affect the other players on the table that are not playing properly or playing the basic strategy. So if everybody at the table, if you're playing blackjack, and all of you six people at the table are all playing perfect basic strategy, then you can cut the house down. But 
to a less of an advantage. But however, you still are not likely to come out ahead all the time. Video poker is a little different because you don't have anybody else affecting the cards. You don't have anybody else making a decision that changes what cards you could possibly get. So there are folks that claim that they are making a living on playing video poker, but I can tell you that they go through huge upswings and downswings. So, for example, if I were to give you $10,000 and your job was to go play video poker for eight hours a day for the next, for the next month, let's just say five days a week, just a 40-hour work week, you chances are could take that 10000 and if you play perfect strategy, you may be able to make some money. You may be able to hit a, a, a royal flush jackpot. And most royal flushes right now are like four grand. So if you get lucky if over the month, there is a possibility to get there. But you have to be playing basic perfect strategy, and you have to be playing a lot of hands. I'm talking a lot of hands. Because if you're going to do that for a living, you literally have to play enough hands that the house advantage is reduced. Because if you play over a short time, your chances are you're not going to get there. But with a long-term strategy where you're playing the same way on the same game, you can get there. But there's still no, there's still no guarantee that a royal flush is going to hit within that month. You're still looking to try to get to that random outcome of cards that are going to get there. So, and then when you're not playing on those eight hours, Somebody else may hit a royal flush at some point, which changes, takes away into that peaks and valleys that we were talking about earlier. So is it possible? I guess, but I certainly have not seen, I've never ran into anybody that said that they were, but that I was able to look up and confirm that. Most of the people that I've seen, and I have access to the player record, most of the people that I've seen in casinos that have video poker make that claim, and you'll see that the casino is actually beating them over the long term. You know, they may be up and they may make a living for a couple months, but then they're going to have two or three bad months. And they think they're making a living, but they're barely making it. They're not making a living to the sense of having all the things that they want out of their life. They're just, you know, it's just a, a different way of doing things. So, anywho, that's the best way I can answer that one. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. And that is all the questions that we have now. If questions pop up as you review the session later, feel free to reach me at the Problem Gambling Network at Ohio at dlongmire at pgnohio.org or uh, phone me at 614-750-9899. Thank you so much again for uh, your uh, participation today. Hope you all have a wonderful holiday and that you'll join us next month for next month's webinar where we hope to really tackle daily fantasy sports. Thank you again, and we'll look forward to chatting with you again soon. Goodbye, everyone. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.